Hello and welcome to our time. Over the last few years, we've become very used to seeing people signing as medical professionals and politicians have been making announcements on TV, especially during the coronavirus announcements. But what is the language they're actually signing in? Is it English or is it another language? My special guests on this episode are Alison Wotherspoon, who's the producer, and Anne Tassoulis, who's the writer-director of a documentary called The Silent World of Barry Pioni. Um, and I'm very keen to understand more about signing and about the program. So welcome, girls. Hi, how Hi. are you going? Oh, I'm very well. So just your... Alison, the producer. And your... And Tassoulis... The writer, director, we, co-producer. We talked about Tassoulis yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, tell that story because I love that story. <laughs> it, uh, I used to work as a, we used to call ourselves barmaid in those days, many years yes. ago in Melbourne. And the publican came up to me and she goes, and she says, are you Irish? I said, <laughs> Irish? Where did you get Irish from? She says, your name? I said, what do you mean? She goes, Tassoulis, you know, like O'Reilly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm Greek. <laughs> yes. yes, that's amazing, isn't it? It's funny how people perceive things. Well, even worse, I'm with a group of friends, and or well, people, and there's this woman, she keeps on going, Antisoulis this, Antisoulis that, Antisoulis this. Well, oh. I'm there. I said to her, it hit me. I said, did you know that my name is Anne? Anne. Tassoulis? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was like Anastasia. <laughs> <laughs> Just a whole but, but see, isn't that interesting? Because this is the perception people have of the English language. Mm. But if you can't speak and need to sign, what, what? I mean, signing is not in English, is it? No. No. It's in Auslan. It's, it's its explain, own language. Yes, it's explain Auslan. Because we've been watching people doing this and... And, and sometimes it actually upstages whatever the story is because the movements are so interesting and you're waiting for the word that might be the rude word or whatever that looks like it might sneak <laughs> in. Um, but, but just explain the background of, of the language. Well, it's interesting because there's actually most countries have their own sign language. So oh, do it's they? not the mm. same. Oh, so well, Japanese sign language, Chinese sign language, American sign there's language. There's a universal sign language as well. Right. And is that, oh, no, because Auslan is... Auslan's an Australian sign Australian, language. Right. So it's actually different to American sign language or British sign language. Right. And it's quite exciting because they've managed to now make it recognised as an official language in Australia and it's in the national school curriculum which mm. British Sign Language still isn't recognised as its own unique language. Oh, really? Mm. So Auslan is Australian language. Mm. Auslan. Right? Oh, yeah. right, OK. So, uh, you know, people think that they just sign in English, but a lot of people who are deaf and use Auslan find it very difficult to read and write in English because it's very different. It's structured very differently. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, they can, you know, a lot of them can read captions on the TV and things like that, but um, not all of them, because it's a very different language in terms of the words are the same, you know, they're English words. I mean, when you um, sign your name, it's A-N-N-E for Anne. Yours Say is that again, do that again. A-N-N-E. Right. And Malcolm is M A L. C O L M. How Malcolm. fast would you have to do that to make the name? Pretty fast. Well, that, Can what you happens go fast? is that Alison's name, for example, right. they have Auslan names. We have nicknames. So Alison's name is this because she fences. So that's her name. Barry's name is this right. because he's Italian. Right. <laughs> I'm this because I'm a director. Right. <laughs> and that's okay. how you say director in sign oh, okay. language. Right. Yeah. And um, if you're yeah. having a, a formal well, conversation, you might have. You so might sorry, I've got to, I've got to do this. So that's Jason. <laughs> Jason. He's our director. And this is the editor. Right. Uh, uh, so well, we don't cut anymore, though. No, but that's doesn't matter. Use that yeah. As no, the, that's great. Uh, okay. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to get your background. So, mm -hmm. well, you're talking. Tell us your background. Well, I was a screenwriter for many... Oh, well, I started off as the first, one of the first students here at McGill. Right. Yeah. Because uh, we make this program at the McGill campus of Uni SA, yeah. who also sponsor the program, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah, so I started to be a primary school teacher 
And that somehow led me to writing Here is Humphrey, which led me to screenwriting. So for about... And we just had the conversation that yeah. you never wrote for me when I was doing that show because no. I was before you. You were before I must me, be, yeah. But yeah the funny you must thing be is, younger than me. I won't yeah. say I'm older than you. Yeah, the funny thing is people say, oh, it must be easy to write for Humphrey. Because he doesn't talk. <laughs> he doesn't talk, right? Like but the uh, other actors yeah, do. Yeah, mm. uh, so anyway, that was my first introduction to the film industry or to, you know, media, mm -hmm. to writing. And from then I started writing feature films, had one made in New, Ze in New Zealand, Film Commission made one of them, it went around the world. And then worked writing for new media, did lots of things, worked for Australian Film Commission as a senior project manager. And then I decided, I, I, there's so many fabulous stories in the world, why am I sitting there making them up? Oh, so I how turned, true. Yeah. How so, true. Yeah, yeah, it just seemed, so superficial. So I did my first documentary back in 2014, it came out, and it was a French co-production um, with a French broadcaster in Australia. Um, you might even know the person, Christopher Barnett. Do you remember Christopher Barnett? Mm, from that? I yeah. can't say that I do, Any. no. So I made that one, and I just loved the journey of making documentaries. Then I made my second documentary where I went to Gaza, and shot a film about the Palestinians, and that was just the most amazing experience. Goodness, I imagine. Was yeah. there trouble there then? Or is there ever no, been time No, this was there uh, six months after the last war. I went right, there, right. but it was an absolutely amazing place and totally destroyed. You know, half of it was just destroyed, but the people, their resilience and the, that smile, their laugh, they, they were just beautiful. Beautiful. We're all human at the end of the day and we all need to be able to express, don't we? Oh, yeah, they're such incredible, incredible people mm. from what they've been through and what they still continue to, you know, to endure the oppression. Well, th again, that's, that's the thing. We need to share those stories yeah. with people. Yeah. So your background? My background is I'm from Sydney and I studied at New South Wales Uni a million years ago and wanted to do screen, work in screen and ended up in London with my first job at the BBC in my mid-twenties as an assistant editor and went back to Sydney and worked in documentary as a production manager at Film Australia and ABC, SBS before I moved here and taught screen production at Flinders for 22 years. Right. So, so, and then See, we rarely get to meet the people who make it happen. Because that's what, it, that's what you are, mm. the people that make it happen. We only see the people on the screen that you're making the stories about, but yeah. we don't know really the passion that goes into that program behind the scenes. Well, I finished up at Flinders three years ago and Anne and I had known each other for since I'd moved to Adelaide in 97. Right. And she needed a producer. I wanted to go back to producing because I went to film school and studied producing and did a bit before I left Sydney. And so we'd started a company and started making films. And we were lucky enough to get development for a couple of projects and then COVID hit and one was based in Greece and one was um, set all around Australia. So those two kind of hit the floor and we weren't going to go anywhere for a while. And then Anne told me about Barry, who she'd met, and it was like a great story. So that's when we decided to make a film about Barry Priori. Right. Yeah, it was funny because we had two that uh, we had to get rid of because of COVID. Yeah. And so we thought, we've got to make a film, a documentary, the next one's got to be in Adelaide. And uh, I started learning Auslan, yeah, with Barry. This he was is because my... you know this. Yeah, he was my teacher. Alison came for a few lessons. Uh, she'd come in every so often. Yeah. And uh, as I got better with the Auslan and I could converse with him, I started asking about him because you know, that's what I do as a director and as a mm. writer. I'm always wanting to know about people. Mm. So he started telling me his story and I just went, Wow. I went over to Alison and I said, Alison, you know, <laughs> bugging overseas in the interstate was a story here in Adelaide yeah. that we won't have to worry about COVID. And anyway, so I told Alison the story. She was like, oh. Then she started coming and meeting Barry and, and she fell in love with him as well. Yep. You know, as a character, he's just the most amazing chap. And uh, it, but it was a very hard slog. You know, it's not easy. You, you know, uh, making a documentary, it's like you're cooking for 200 people 
and they've eaten in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, but the point is you can't shoot a documentary in any sort of real sequence or anything. You've got to capture those special moments, really, don't you? So and it means you've got to be there. Well, it was also really interesting because we were trying to get funding for it and we had crowdfunding, and that allowed us to film Barry and preliminary stuff. And we thought once we had additional funding, we'd go back and... Um, film him again, but he actually passed away in March this year. So before we got fully funded, Barry died. So we ended up using this preliminary interview as the bulk. Well, that's the Barry you see on screen, which was really interesting. Yes, yeah, so it was going to be a future like doco. Mm. Well, that's for a the real Adelaide. rethink, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Actually, spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> yeah, we got developed money through SAFC and Screen Australia to develop the doco. So we did. Uh, a lot of interviews and that's what you do when you're going to develop with documentary you shoot as much as you can because you mm. don't know whether you're going to get it later on yeah, and then work and out how god, it goes together later yeah. So, yeah and thank god we did that yes because we had his footage but originally it was going to be for the Adelaide film festival feature length 80 minute but because barry got very ill and passed away in march we knew that Compass wanted the story. Right. They wanted a half-hour version. So. Right. Well, we're going to show a little bit about yeah. of that in a minute. Yeah. And we'll be back to do just that and to talk a little bit more about Barry and the journey that these girls have been on to make the show happen. Mm -hmm. See you in a tick. Mm -hmm. Our special guests on this episode of Our Time are Alison Wotherspoon, who's the producer, and Anne Soulis, who is the writer-director of a documentary which is called... The Silent World of Barry Priori. I wondered whether you, you both opened your mouth at the same time. <laughs> I was hoping you'd do it in unison. Oh, now, no. we've, now we've rehearsed it. Let's do it again. And the documentary is called... The, the Silent, Silent World, World of Barry, Barry Priori. Priori. See, a writer-director and a producer, they can get together. <laughs> Absolutely. No, so, now Barry passed away, as we've discussed already, and you had shot a whole lot of vision. You didn't quite know, I guess, how it would actually come together, but the fact that you had it meant that you could edit it to make sense of the story. Yep. And here's just a clip of that doco, which is going to go to air on the ABC. Mm -hmm. Just explain that. Uh, it's on ABC Compass on the 28th of August this month. Right. So, and it's also on iView? Is it it's on going iView? to be on iView, iView as well. well. Yep. Okay. And it's going to be also on uh, uh, ABC T Plus. TV Plus on ABC as well. Right. Mm. Okay. Let's have a look at the clip and then we can talk about why this makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's signing there and you, obviously you're going back on his backstory. Mm -hmm. It's the history of Barry and the fact that he was born into an Italian migrant family. So there was a range of language issues there for him. Isn't it brilliant? You've got this vision. Mm. The um, thing with Barry, which was really interesting, is that it wasn't just that he was deaf. Uh, it was that he had no language till the age of 10. Isn't so that So he had no for form of communication. How did you say you were hungry? Toilet. But, well, he, well had... he could gesture. He could. He had, with his family, they were all hearing. They, yeah, they, so I suppose you, know, you do get used to your kids. The thing is, you couldn't have a conversation. No. You couldn't, you couldn't go more than, I'm hungry or, you know, I need new clothes or something. But he had no... So he was, had eight siblings, seven siblings. So it was a and huge And they weren't family. allowed to talk with him. Well, no, well was, they couldn't talk to him. No, but they couldn't use their hands to talk? Is, well, is no, that... this is when he was talking about being at school. Oh, but right. in the family, he was learning... Oralism was the thing in the 50s and 60s, so deaf children from two and a half, like, would be sent to deaf school at two and a half so that they would learn language and some way of communicating. Mm. But the emphasis was on lip reading and speaking. Oh, right. So he was learning English, but then going into a family where his parents spoke Italian. Oh, how convenient. And so, you know, his ability to lip read and understand was between two languages. And also, he, he was profoundly deaf, so it was just really difficult. So the family had, of course, a way of communicating with him. But for him to learn words and to be able to think in a more sophisticated way, right. it was only when he learned sign language at 11 that then he started realising things about the family that he didn't know. Like oh, okay. there were two men that came to his house and he didn't two. know who they were. Right. And when he learned sign language, he found out they were brothers, his brothers. 
and the family assumed he would have known that, but he didn't actually know that himself because right. he just didn't know who mm. these guys who came to the house were. How extraordinary. It's, and it's you just don't not even think. No. You would never think. No. So one day the nun comes to the house and asks him if he wants to learn to play basketball. And he was very excited and so he went with her. And everybody at the basketball match were deaf, all the children were deaf, and they were signing. Ah. And he'd never seen signing before. So it was the first time he'd seen signing because they didn't allow signing. All the children had to learn to speak. So a lot of the deaf children of that generation, born in the 50s and 60s, right. they weren't allowed to sign. They had to, they had to learn to speak. And, and because they couldn't hear, they were difficult to understand. I remember hearing people who are profoundly deaf trying to, mm. well, like some vowel could, sounds. Well, yeah. see, that's where Barry actually, when he spoke at home, he'd be told to shut up because he had a really, he'd be too loud. He didn't know how loud he was. Oh, of course. Or he had a voice that he, you know, and it's really interesting because mm. when you meet his kids, they were hearing children, but both Barry and his wife were deaf and oh. they were really loud kids. And, and it's <laughs> the kids of, you know, coders. They can't, they've been growing up with people who don't speak. So their ability to understand tone and normal conversational right. language is totally different because they did grow up with deaf parents where, you know, they could be as loud as they wanted to and... No one said shh. Mm. No, not, not all of them. Not, not all, all of them. them. Not all of them. Uh, you know, like Emma's different again. Oh, but Emma's mother's uh, hearing. She's hearing, But there's right. different generations. But when you've got was, two parents yeah. who are deaf, yes. you, you don't have a voice... Yes. To understand your yes, own voice as a hearing person. Of course. I suppose until you, until other family members or mm. school teachers mm. or whatever become involved in your life, yes. It was very cruel. He, 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 mm. It was a very cruel world for him mm. until he learnt sign language. Mm. So when he learnt sign language through his best friend who became his lifelong friend and business partner because they both set up a language school, sign language school. Right. Yeah. It's fascinating when you watch people doing that because, you know, we don't sort of consider the, the it's, what's the word to use, weaknesses in our system of communication, I suppose. Mm. We don't consider someone, may, like I'm, I'm going deaf because of my age probably, as was the doctor keeps saying, what do you expect at your age? <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, but, yes, I'm finding it hard to hear. So I'm starting to lip read now mm. a lot in circumstances where I don't hear very well. That's in crowds mm. um, and because that background noise just cuts off your hearing. Um, so many people the same. Yeah, people well, don't realise that they... I know as, as soon as I walk into someone's house, if I hear the TV is loud... I know they can't hear. Don't come to my house then. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sure I wear, the neighbours can hear everything. Yeah, I wear two hearing aids. Okay. Yeah. But I wasn't diagnosed till I was 35. And when I went to the audiologist and he was telling my son what he should do that she's deaf, and I'm saying, no, I'm not. And I don't need hearing aids. He says, you lip read. I said, no, I don't lip read. And then I realised I know more about a person's mouth than I do about the colour of their eyes. I've got eyes. to tell you, I've been watching your mouth the whole time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Give us a kiss. He said. <laughs> uh, 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 do you mind showing us your hearing aids? I shouldn't. I should have asked you before, but uh, oh, they're little them. baby, tiny ones. Uh, there they are. Now we can talk about it. She doesn't know what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, just sorry. Just um, these are these are these are Bluetooth. Now, these ah. are amazing because they link in with my telephone and my computer and anything that's got Bluetooth, I can hear them straight through my hearing aids. Okay, g give me back because I never got a chance to get a close-up uh. of that. Can you zoom in and just see? That, For that, people that don't know, so this fits right inside your ear. Oh, well, it fits. Here you go. Look. Yeah, no, we can see that part. <laughs> yeah. We just wanted to see how yeah. big it was with my fat fingers. Well, these are, so that, 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 these, are quite, these ones are, are bigger than normal because they're Bluetooth. Right. Yeah. Usually they're a bit smaller. You can get them smaller. It depends on yeah, what you want I've to spend. I've got one that's and... quite small that just fits yeah, in. Yeah, Which yeah. I use if I'm going to see a live show or movies or even sometimes watching TV. Because the background noise that appears to be in everything that we mm. don't really realise is there mm. um, tends to cut through that. We lose mm. our hearing apparently in the speech level, which is mm. just fabulous. Mm. So I appreciate what you're saying with all of this, yeah. 
The thing with the doco, though, and this is what we're very careful about, we're not experts on the diff. No. We're not, we, 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 we didn't set ourselves up to say that we know everything about the deaf and we're going to make a documentary. No, you're telling his story. Mm. It, we're telling their story. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, for me, as a doco maker, what I love is I hear a story. I hear, you know, I, I love biographies. I like mm. doing biographies. So I hear about someone and I just... And as you start uncovering like an onion, all these richness and textures and everything in that story. I mean, mm. human stories are just amazing. Mm. And and just like I'm going on that journey, discovering that story, I bring the audience with me. Mm. And that's how my my style of documentary making is, is that you 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 start discovering. It's a, it's a journey. Mm. And, and it's a beautiful thing and I love it, and, uh, which is why I keep doing it, because it's very little money in it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, you know, at some point in our lives we have to stop thinking about the money and think about the living part and exactly. the communication. Because exactly. at the end of the day, what else is there but the other humans around us? I know, that's why I stopped screenwriting. You know, screenwriting was fine, but, you know, it's... Uh, Doing documentaries, God, we've mm. been everywhere, haven't we, Alison? Oh, yeah. We've been to Turkey, we've been to Greece, we've been, you know, mm. it, it's not just the meat, it's the places you get to go yes. to and the people and you the meet. People. And the people. Really, life is about the people at the end but of the it, day. It's the people, exactly. Yeah. But and, it was also just really nice because, because of the relationship that Anne had and that we ended up having with Barry that we then got welcomed into the homes of his friends and family and got to find out about Barry through That's them the as well. Opens. And, you know, yeah. like really interesting stuff and really lovely people in the film that have known him since they were 11 and, you know, have been lifelong mates of Barry. So they're part of the story about Barry. And but also you've left a heritage for mm. his family that's his history. We've got Absolutely. to take a short break and we'll be back to talk to these wonderful ladies in just a moment. <laughs> Uh, we're back with Alison and Anne. Alison, just tell us a bit more about Barry because we've, we've talked about the deafness and all the things that happened, but the man himself. Well, he was amazingly charismatic, really engaging, really funny man, and he managed to teach people through his love of Auslan and his love of communicating and people. He's, he ended up being a really significant teacher of Auslan and mentor of people studying Auslan, particularly hearing people who learnt Auslan, who then went on to work as interpreters and work with the deaf community. But part of his appeal was he also, because he was so funny and he wanted to share Auslan with people, he did a fringe show called Naughty Hands, which actually ran over a number of fringes and he had 38 sellout shows where oh. he would teach people in the audience to swear and pick up people in Auslan <laughs> and all the things he couldn't do as a teacher in his classes. He could do but he also knew people wanted to know. I mean, how do you talk about swear words and people in, you know, in Auslan and there's this rich, fabulous world of swearing and picking up and <laughs> everything you can say in any language you can say in Auslan, which was part of his joy of engaging people. Yes. So, so do people create the moves? Um, I mean, there are new words coming into our language all the time, so... It's really interesting. I, I assume so. I mean, we sort of... I don't know. You know, like, no. I don't know enough about Auslan no, to like know... like you said before, you're not they experts created, in like, it. They created, this is COVID. See? Is, yeah, well, yeah. there's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. is COVID. So yeah. they, you know, they keep on building their, you know, and with even, the new words. It was only in the 90s that this became the sign for Auslan. Yeah, this is Auslan right. and this is signing. Right. This is how you say signing so, right. and this is Auslan. Is, is, so the is there signing, can, can you sign something that says keep yourself nice till then? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> do, you know, do you know anything for that? Keep whole, yourself nice till then. Well, that's what it. I say because we're about to go because <laughs> our time is up. But I always say at the end of the show, we'll see you next time on our time. Keep yourself nice till then. If you'd ah. given us a heads up, we could have found out for you. We could have. <laughs> that's a bit complicated for me. Teach me later uh, and I'll... I, I, I'm not proficient. I, I don't know I love it. Things. I love it. Yeah, I'm planning to... I'm enrolling in Auslan next year at TAFE because I missed this year's intake. Oh, right. So. Well, when teach I find me that, out, I'd love back. to be able to but do that. But before we go, watch it on the ABC. Oh, yes. Timing. Yes. 
Uh, 6.30, ABC Compass, 28th of August. It's also going to be seen on TV, uh, Plus. TV Plus and it will be available on iView and we believe it will be on iView for the whole three years of the licence with the ABC. How so brilliant. How people brilliant. can find and it. It's totally we need fascinating. These inspiration, it's inspiration a totally story. fascinating story because he's the most amazing man mm. and what he's achieved. And we, the whole purpose of this doco is to make people aware about the deaf community and what a rich culture yeah. it is. It's Absolutely. an incredibly rich culture. Well, our rich culture has come to an end. We've got to say goodbye. <laughs> so until next time, whatever it is, keep yourself nice till then. Thanks, girls, so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having us.